came back, and uh, he's in the Army, and practices over at Bannigan, and you've already heard a little bit about what he specializes in, and uh, I think you're also practicing down uh, one day a week at uh, one, one day a month. One day a month. Yeah, at Alan Morris, the clinic in the morning and operate in the afternoon. Okay, super. What was the name again? My name's Jack Walter. Can anybody hear him without this? Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. a good first name. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> first name, isn't it? <laughs> no, Mike, come up. Mike, come up. Want a mic? Want a mic? Okay. It's a little sensitive. I'm going to try to turn it down a little bit. It's uh, a little sensitive earlier. Let's put it down. Uh, yeah, yeah, the little up there. The ladies should be here. They are in the cops. They're just coming in. So thanks for giving me the opportunity to come speak with you guys today. I do appreciate your time. Um, and I think I can hopefully answer some questions for you and kind of you know, give you my take on, on an important part of quality of life, which is comments. And we often joke that nobody ever died in wet pants, but a lot of people wish they would. Um, and it, it's really true. So, you know, what can we do to make continents better? And so many of the things that we do are things that are driven by you. So as Mel was saying, if you get healthier, guess what? Your continents gets better. There's great data that goes with weight loss and level of continents. Mm -hmm. And guess what? If you avoid those bladder irritants and you do things like time voiding and you take care of yourself and you get your diabetes under control and you know improve your overall health, you're going to be drier. Now unfortunately, we're talking to men that have had prostate cancer therapy you know, by and large here, and those things don't always get you the level of continence you want. Uh, and we can talk about you know, what we can do to make things better. Um, briefly, let's, let me see if I can advance here. So bottom line is we're going to kind of talk about post prostatectomy post-radiation therapy, continents, and, and what we can do to make things better. So that's kind of the, the goal of the talk here. And this is me. 99% um, of my time, I am at the Army. I'm a current active duty colonel, and I'm at 19 years right now, and I'm looking hard and fast for jobs. And I grew up in Muckleteo, and this is as close as I could get in the Army, and <laughs> be in the Army still. My parents said I didn't go very far in life, made it about 90 minutes. Um, <laughs> and very likely I'll end up at Multicare, I don't know. And so they, right now they don't really have all the stuff that I want to be able to do what I want to offer this community. And we're in negotiations to try and expand that footprint to increase the aerodynamic capability and increase the in-office type diagnostics that I want to be able to do the job like I do my job now, like I was trained to do my job and like I will do my job in 12 months I'm out of the Army. But you know, hopefully that will happen there. Because um, I want to stay put. My kids are in high school. I've got one's about to start high school in a couple of years, and none of them want to leave. So this is this is home to us. Uh, we've been here now since 2011. This time, um, I did my residency here from 2000 through 05 at Madigan. Army sent me a couple different places, and fellowship was one of those. And, and I've been lucky enough to be back and be stable. And, and the goal is to, to be here long term. Um, if you guys do want to see me over at Allenmore, if you're not military beneficiaries, I do see a clinic. It's usually one Friday uh, a month, and uh, I talk to people in the morning, and then we operate in the afternoon. Would not be the same day. It would be, you know, if you wanted something done, or we said, hey, you know, you'd be a candidate for this. That would be on down the road, okay? Um, but that is that is still an option there. So I have to say this, okay, obviously what I say is what Jack Walter believes. It's not a reflection of what the Army believes, what the DOD believes, or what the U.S. government believes. And I, that's kind of the, the disclaimer I have to put on everything because I am still active duty Army, okay? Um, the next thing is, of course, you know, do you trust me or not? And how do we trust people in, in medicine? It's... <coughs> Is disclosures. I'm not getting paid to do this. I don't work for AMS. I don't get anything from AMS. And AMS is one of the big, you know, men's continents, men quality of life type companies that are out there. I'm paid by the Army, so that, that's my, my disclosure, okay? Um, a lot of good people actually work for them as well, it's just that's it's not me. So what do we need to do to talk about our 
comments? You know, what is it? Who is it? And what causes it? Um, so we use a couple terms to kind of set some baselines. Okay, stress urinary incontinence is an important topic and you know, like horrible name. You know, it should be called activity incontinence or something else because it's not a psychological diagnosis and um, it's confusing. So I apologize about that. I didn't pick those words. Stress urinary incontinence is I do something such as coughing, sneezing, laughing, standing up, and I leak urine. And that is almost to a fault post prostatectomy incontinence, okay? And why is that? Because what keeps us from being wet from a stress activity or some other type of like leakage like that is our sphincter mechanism. And those are our little valves that keep us dry, one of which gets removed and one of which may get damaged at the time of surgery, and radiation can, can cause a, a number on them as well. Um, not near as common for stress and incontinence, but very possible. Urgent incontinence is a different beast altogether, okay? And you mentioned you're on Mirabagon, and great, wonderful drug. The nice thing about it really is the side effect profile. Efficacy is very similar to a lot of the other drugs we have. What is urge incontinence? Urge is, I've got to go to the bathroom, I can't get there in time, and I leak. And more often than not, people come in and say, well, I don't really have either one of those. If you have urge incontinence, you don't have either one of those. You just don't realize it, okay? Your bladder is misbehaving and you're not feeling it, and it's squeezing when it should not, and that bladder squeeze makes you leak urine, okay? And, you know, the great thing is it's not sexist. Women have this probably as much as men, if not more. Um, but, you know, we have, to, we have to deal with it, and it is a, a huge impact on quality of life for us. Um, going just to the men, though, this is the, the basic schemata of the male pelvis, and prostate's in a horrible location. And you guys have probably seen these pictures a thousand times, so I apologize, but it's really good just to kind of look at them again when we talk about continents. So bladder's here. Prostate's here, this is that pubic bone that we're talking about. And when we were talking before, it's kind of on the sideline of, hey, if you have a pelvic fracture, this is fused to this. And you can imagine if you break your pelvic bone, what happens? The urethra and prostate get shorn apart, okay? They get tear apart. Your sphincter, your external sphincter, the one that the radical prostatectomists want to preserve is right here. And then your urethra goes on out. So in your case, if you're getting a turp done, what is that? It means we're driving up. We're sitting right here. See this little tube coming in with the scleral whale? That's the ejaculatory duct, so that's where the ejaculate hits the urethra when you're having sex and climax. This is what's getting removed. This little part of the prostate up here. It's probably closer to half. It's probably not quite where it should be. But realize we're not touching any of this on downstream. And so from a continent standpoint, very unusual to have activity or stress in continents because you have all this part still there. Very common to have urgency and urgent continence after a turf. And, you know, that's something that gets better for most men, but gets better over months. So it's like, you know, talk to me in 12 months and we'll see how your urge is at this point in time. Um, just because that bladder can misbehave and if that bladder squeezes, you're not ready to hold on to it because you're relying just on that external center. When you, you guys know what Kegel exercises are? You've been in pelvic floor physical therapy, you know what Kegel exercises are. You know, you're trying to squeeze and elevate the urethra up into your body, you know, elevator going up to your belly button, those kind of things. Um, that's this. That's what we're trying to get you to contract, okay? Um, when you're doing a radical prostatectomy, they're cutting here and they're cutting here, okay? What does that do? That takes out one of your spectrum mechanisms. This now has to be refashioned. That bladder neck might not be the size of the urethra, so they might have to kind of, they call it fish mouth, or kind of close it down on the left and right side and sew it back together. And the good news is that this is almost always done robotically now. And it really has changed my life because before the era of radical work people prostatectomy, yeah, okay, so activity related to is way higher. They can't prove it, but I, I tell you, my practice has totally shifted away from the high volume urinary incontinence of open prostatectomy and now people are doing it robotically. Um, there was an LA learning curve that people went through kind of in the, the mid 2000s with it. But, you know, in our hospital now, there are two guys that do this, and they don't give me much work from large volume stress or incontinence, which is great. And, you know, if I can give up that work, that's wonderful. Dawn probably cringes because she wants that work there. What gives us work now is the combination of radiation and radical prostatectomy. And for me to implant a non-radiated sphincter, which we'll talk about sphincters in a bit, or incontinence, very rare anymore. Just we don't see that patient anymore because the amount of incontinence men have after Robotic prostatectomy is not the same degree that it was before when we got open surgery. 
I'm doing a lot of talking. Please feel free to interrupt me. You know, this is super casual. I took my coat off. I was hot. I'm sorry. Um, but if you guys have questions, don't, don't wait. Yeah, sure. How can you do all that? Like you did, Kurt? So they do it little piece by little piece at a time. So, uh, not not joking, but you know, we have a camera, and the camera's about yay big around, and it's got a little loop in it, a little electrocardiography loop that just scoops out the prostate little piece by little piece. Now, there are a couple different ways that it can be done. Um, some people will use a laser to kind of ablate the tissue. Um, some people will do the rotor rooter or turp to kind of remove the tissue. That's really the gold standard. Um, that is one of the lasers. There are a couple different lasers that, that do it. So there's a side fire green light laser, it's probably the most common one. Um, that's just the pure on ablation. There's another one where they use a, a holmium laser where they kind of a nucleate or kind of cut around that big lobe of prostate tissue, drop it into the bladder, then chew it up and pull it out. Um, so a couple different ways to do it. Uh, that one where they enucleate is not near as common, uh, but it seems to work pretty well. People are also doing it with water now. So there's actually a, a robot that you can set parameters and it will water ablate your prostate. Um, so th there's a bunch of ways to do it. Uh, gold standard and what's been done for the last, gosh, I don't know, 100 years is a transverse section of the prostate. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why it's still probably the best one in my opinion. Um, just some of the side effects from lasers can be kind of approach some men, especially the urgency frequency stuff. Uh, yeah, there's been two urologists that have been shot in the last decade by patients, both of them were green light laser patients, because they had such horrible urgency frequency that they didn't know about. They shot and killed their urologist. One was in orange and one was in Reno. Uh, so that happened and kind of made us all scared to do green light, I'll be honest. Sorry, Don. <laughs> Don's company bought green light. <laughs> yes. Prostate surgery, they take that uh, one thing out, the actual... Take out, well, the one sphincter, so let me back it up. The one sphincter is your bladder neck prostate complex, where the two are married, and you have to cut it to remove that area. Even um, if you, have, you don't have the radical, you, you still have to cut it? Um, so, if you don't have the radical, so when I say radical, I'm meaning a cancer operation. When I say simple prostatectomy, I'm talking about a benign operation for not cancer. So some men, say you have a really big prostate, they don't want to do rotor root running because it's too big, you can get a simple prostatectomy, which is kind of a bad word, but it just means not cancer operation. And what they'll do is they go through the bladder, it'll go through the top here, and they'll just pull out part of the prostate, leaving part of it behind. Now that one, depending if you go through the bladder, you probably took out that complex and apart. If you go from above, you don't take it out as much, but you're still really reliant on that bottom sphincter to keep you dry. What what is uh, the background on the question? Well, I had prostate surgery, but I had the uh, and they did it robotically. Uh huh. For cancer? Yeah. Or for for prostate cancer? Okay. Well, some men, you know, have a simple prostatectomy. Uh, even with a robot, will just remove because they say, hey, you know, I came in, uh, my PSA was normal, I'm having obstructive urinary symptoms and my prostate's huge, and they take it out, and they send it to the pathologist, and the pathologist says, hey, by the way, that guy had prostate cancer. So that, that's some men, and that's why I wasn't sure what, what I was wondering what to So your operation was a cancer operation. So they, you had a radical prostatectomy, it wasn't simple. They took out the entire prostate, including that upper sphincter mechanism. Yeah. No matter how it was done. Uh, no matter how that's done, that, that, that top sphincter is gone if you've had prostate cancer surgery. Okay, okay, thank you. No, no, please, any other questions? Yeah. The sphincter on the bottom. Yeah. Is that one used more before the prostatectomy? Is it used more before? Yeah. Uh, no, you know, it's used before because that's one you actually have control over. So if you like, I, I want to stop peeing, that's the one you're squeezing, okay? But you don't control that internal one, the upper one. So it, it's got a mind of its own. It works all off of reflexes. Um, so when your bladder starts leaking down to the lower sphincter, the sphincter will hold. Should. Well, up to a point, yeah. yeah. I mean, the, there are some people that walk into my clinic that have not had any gun surgically at all, and they wet their pants and they're men, okay? And, and so men can have urge incontinence okay. regardless, but yeah, in general, the combination of the two will keep you dry. I mean, most men don't come in wet. Most men that haven't had prostate therapy come in saying, I can't pee. You know, it's usually, it works too well. Usually you're kind of shut down instead of wide open. Okay. Thank you. No problem.
So, you know, what causes activity or stress urinary incontinence? So, in this room, we all know what it is. It was prostate cancer therapy, okay? It'd be a surgery, it'd be a radiation therapy. They both cause it. The risk of incontinence from a TERP that's activity related, I, I quote 1%. You can see a range there, 0. 0.5 to 3. Um, and that's the, being very clear, the activity related. The urgency, I got to go and I don't get there in time and I leak, that's higher than that, okay? That is, for most men, temporary though. And most men, it's like, you know what, you start on some medications like Mirabagon or one of his cousins, and then you're, you're doing better. Um, it takes time though. You got to kind of visualize like you know, your body's getting ready to hit a, a storm door, right? We took the storm door out and put a screen door in. And you know, if you do that, you fall down and hit the ground on the outside. Same kind of thing with the urinary tract. That bladder's getting ready to squeeze really hard. That bladder's been obstructed, it's been blocked, and it's really kind of irritated by the, the obstruction from the prostate itself. The bladder's misbehaving, it's squeezing when it shouldn't. And that's why that urgency is so high. And it takes a while to retrain your bladder to not have that. Some men don't retrain, and those are the ones that are the most frustrated. The green light laser can have pretty significant urgency symptoms like that, so much so that a lot of people are actually using you know, fairly high dose steroids trying to suppress that inflammation that causes it. Um, pelvic trauma, we talked about that some as well, obviously. Anything that can damage the, strict, or the sphincter mechanism can make you leak, okay? So when, it, when we talk about incontinence, we really talk about all the different facets of your life that really kind of get affected by this. You know, I, I can't tell you how many patients come in and say, Doc, I want to go to Europe, but I don't know what kind of pads they're going to have there, and I can't pack enough suitcases to take them with me. Um, Tell them they're a wide body jet. A wide body jet. No, that's what doing self cap. Not everybody's doing self cap. Most of them are leaking. Um, a lot of men won't wear tan pants. It's very interesting. You talk to an incontinence clinic, and you go in there and you look at them, and they're all wearing black pants or dark blue pants. And the reason for that is people notice the, the difference in tan colors. So if you get your pants wet and you gotta go change your pants, you pick up on those pants are a little bit different shade of tan. You don't pick up on it in dark blue and black as much. And we really see that in our female patients. They do a lot of female incontinence as well. And it's like they're all wearing dark clothes because if you get your pants wet, you know, it's embarrassing. You gotta try and change your clothes. No one likes that and be like, hey, did you change your pants today? Um, and it, it, it really just kind of impacts your life on multiple levels. Uh, you know, things like exercise. I'm telling you, hey, if you exercise, you're not gonna leak as much. And you say, doc, I can't work out because I'm wet all the time and I get rash from wearing my pads. And these stories are, are very, very common and, uh, and I get that and I, I see that. And I know it's a struggle and that, again, is not a sexist thing. It happens to women all the time too. They're like, I want to go run and I can't run now because I'm wet. So it's like, okay, do we sometimes jump ahead a little bit to do things that are a little more invasive even though there are some less invasive options because of that? Yeah, we do. Um, you know, can you end up having you know, skin breakdown from incontinence? Can you end up having you know, decubitus ulcers? They, you know, the worst thing is you see someone that's incontinent and as they progress and deteriorate, they're not getting up out of bed, they're not changing their, their, their diapers. And you know, that, this is a, a chronic problem that, that does not end you know, as our health deteriorates. They say, well, I'm not as active as more, I don't leak as much. You know, I hear you, but you're not able to get to the bathroom as easily then as you you know, deteriorate physically as well. And those kind of things, you know, make a huge negative impact on quality of life for you. We talked earlier about possible kidney damage. If we yeah. This bladder, if kidney sure. What's a good measurement of kidney damage? High bun? No. I mean, the, so very unique population. Don't come out of here thinking I'm going to get kidney damage because I'm doing self-catheterization over chat. Okay? This is a rarity. Okay. Uh, the only way to... And someone who's on intermittent catheterization in my practice, I want them to get a year dynamics or bladder pressure study every one to two years. Most of them kind of err towards that two to three year mark though, is because they don't want to come in for the study. And I get annual kidney ultrasounds. Um, kidney function, that, when you've had a hit, your kidney function is too late. I don't want to know after the damage is done. I want to know before you get there. Some of the early telltale signs is like, man, I was doing okay, and all of a sudden I've had five infections over the last you know, six months, what happened? That's one of those indicators you may have been changing bladder pressure. Um, so that, that's a rare thing. Is it the guy like you that can have that happen though? Yeah, it is. Guess what? Radiation makes your bladder stick. And again, these are rare things, but you're on that pathway of having rare bad problems. And you just kind of, and you're, you're staying in front of it, you're, you're engaged with your team meteorologist, it's the right thing to do. Um, but realize you, 
have been a survivor, and that's awesome, but at the same time, it means that you have kind of some, some issues that may pop up. And, you know. Now that bladder has a muscle around. Is that true? Bladder, bladder has multiple layers of muscle. It's squeezed to let you pee when they're working the way it should. Can we rehab that muscle surgically? No. Yeah. So we can make your tube better, we can't make your pump stronger. Hmm. And if your pump becomes stiff, um, yeah, big operations that leave you so it doesn't work to make it stretchy. Again, this super rare type thing. Question about this medication. Yeah, Mary Brown? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Supposedly it helps the F3 pathway. What is that? You said F3? Mm -hmm. So it's a bit at, so when you look at, when you look at how the bladder is innervated, there's two sets of nerves that come down onto the bladder itself, okay? One of them blocks one pathway, one of them blocks the other. So this is the one that's actually, it's a beta agonist. So it actually, it, it's stimulating your, sorry, parasympathetic nervous system. So we think about fight or flight. So the bladder lives on fight or flight, and we're getting way in the weeds here, so I'm sorry if we bore everybody else, we lose everybody here real quick, but you, bladder works on fight or flight. And when you are scared, you don't want your bladder to, to contract, right? So when you're running away from the bear, you want to be dry, okay? <laughs> so what does that do? One, it closes your sphincter down, and two, it tells your bladder muscle to relax, okay? So that's the big sympathetic push. So the parasympathetic does the opposite. It makes the sphincter relax, and it makes the bladder squeeze. This one, in effect, activates that sympathetic pathway to make the bladder muscle relax. So we're trying to reteach the bladder what it should be doing all the time. Yeah. Um, you're trying to make the body's natural response not as aggressive as it once was. And, you know, everybody's, you know, a lot of people have seen like the Detrol, Ditropan, Vesicare, Oxybutynin, Solafenacin, Enablex. There's all these other drugs that are out there that work on that other pathway. This is the only one that works on the path, the, other, the opposite path. There's two pathways. That's the only drug that works on one of them. The great thing about that drug is it doesn't cause the side effects of the other drug. Those are dry mouth. Those are constipation. Okay? Those are the, the really annoying ones that this doesn't have. Because so many people are like, so let me get this straight. You're going to give me a drug that makes me thirsty all the time, and I drink more, and I wet my pants more. <laughs> makes sense for me. You're going to give me a drug that makes me constipated, and we know constipation is one of the big risk factors for urge and comments because the body can't tell a full rectum from a full bladder very well. Um, so that's what's nice about this drug. Now, interestingly, you had an issue of high blood pressure, and that one can cause high blood pressure about 5% of people, but that wasn't you, obviously. So, um. How big is your bladder? How big is the bladder? It's no right answer. Ounces. It's no right answer. Capacity wise. There's no right answer. <laughs> so your bladder is different than your bladder is different than your bladder is different than my bladder. Tell the way go back to your dynamics that was done. I'm sorry, say again. What's that? The results of the your dynamics that I had. Is uh -huh. it on that test somewhere? I have got the Sure. Test well, you know how big your bladder is because when you void, if you measure it and then you catheterize yourself afterwards, you'll see exactly what your bladder capacity is. Right? Nobody can But you're catheterizing. So you know what? I cannot empty my bladder. I've been told I cannot empty my bladder even with catheterization. It's impossible. You get awful close. I mean, we're talking two, three milliliters for most men. Unless you have a bunch of diver tape in your Yeah, You're getting pretty close. Uh, we like to see bladder capacities, you know, in the 300 to 400 range. Yeah, if you're getting there, it's pretty safe. So that's not unrealistic. Like three to four hundred. No, not at all. Okay. Not at all. When you're young, when you're really full, you're probably all the leader. <laughs> uh, urologists do stupid things in the Euro Flow Olympics to see who can hold the most. You know, people get up around a leader. Um, not, not recommended, but realize you, you can do that. Uh, but th there's no right answer, though, you know, because someone who's seven feet tall is going to have bigger bladder capacity than someone who's four feet tall, right? So. <clears throat> so prostate cancer, you guys know this better than I do because you guys live this. Very, very common disease in men, obviously. A whole bunch of radical prostatectomies are performed every year, and that's where a percentage of those men then come down to see me, okay? So I don't do that operation. There are people that do that operation for a living. Those are the people that should be doing that operation. 
Um, I don't think they should be doing the other operations that I do, just because if we do one operation, we'd probably do it a lot better than if we're trying to do a little bit of everything. Um, but you, you, you get what you get sometimes. Um, I'm not saying that people can't do multiple operations, but if you have somebody that does something for a living, they probably do it more frequently and are, are more comfortable with the, the nuances of it than those that do not. Um, and as we progress, you're going to see this more and more. We're going to go more of a European model in the United States as long as you're in a, a population that will support that, um, where, guess what, that person does the rapid prostatectomies for this cohort of people, or that person does the TERPs for this cohort of people, and we're, we're on that pathway. Europe's already doing it, um, uh, and it, it makes sense. The problem with America, though, is space. So if you're in the middle of nowhere, you get the urologist that does everything, and, and that's just a reality, because guess what? You're in the middle of nowhere, and you don't want to go to the city. And, and we see that, and we get that, and that, that's fine, um, but... Well, you drive to Seattle? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you want me to go 30 miles away? No way. Um, so we, we get that even in our community here, where people that want to go from Puyallup to Tacoma, like, I don't want to drive that far. Okay. okay. I understand. <laughs> um, incontinence after radical prostatectomy, numbers are all over the place. These numbers are they're total just kind of throw out, hit on the wall, because they don't mean a damn thing. And why do I say that? Because if I did a radical prostatectomy, my incontinence rate would be a heck of a lot higher than 16%, okay? And I know that, and I don't do that operation. Uh, it's just not something I do. And that's why anytime you see these kind of numbers, these are people that are doing this operation over and over and over again. They're not the, hey, I did two radical prostatectomies last year. And, Dirty secrets of medicine, right? But you know, if you are in that spot, ask your surgeon how often do you do this and how many have you done? Because there are definite learning curves, and nobody wants to be a learning curve. And everybody, everybody from my side of the field realizes we have to get through a learning curve somewhere. Um, but hopefully, you do that in a very controlled environment uh, where you're learning on someone else's curve, in a sense. Uh, but you, you need to know those things. So. Continence, leak, 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 and erectile dysfunction. You guys know, some already talked to you guys about erectile dysfunction. Um, we'll get into there. What do we do with the continence, though? And then how do we get you back to, back to the best life you can have? And, you know, this is kind of a, okay, there's urologists that do everything, and there's urologists that do prosthetics. Uh, I'm not a prosthetic urologist, so um, that's offensive, right? Uh, <laughs> I, I described you as a prosthetic <laughs> I'm a reconstructive urologist. <laughs> so uh, we get subdivided in a bunch of things. You know, my fellowship, half of it was post prostatectomy continence. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. But we don't call ourselves prosthetic urologists. And how do we fix post prostatectomy continence? With prosthetics. But we also operate on the urethra. You know, that's where we want to be on the male urethra doing that operation. Um, usually it's restriction is usually something else, but it just gives us a lot of exposure to the same part of the body that we're putting the cuff around, and that's why our practice kind of melds between the two. And there's not really clear lines on what prosthetic urology is, what reconstructive urology is. There's a lot of overlap between those two. So realize it's there. Um, so what can you do? We already talked about what you can do for yourself. So don't wait till you have to go. It sounds so simple. And it is so simple, but it's so hard to do at the same time, okay? Uh, as we age, the innervation of the bladder, the bladder telling us, hey, we're full, isn't as good as it once used to be. Guess what makes it worse? Diabetes, chronic constipation, narcotic use. And narcotic use is super prevalent in America right now, unfortunately. We're hopefully we're getting away from that. Um, but you know, those things really make your bladder not behave the way you want it to. Um, just simply setting your wristwatch to beep every hour and a half or whatever you need to be for your time frame might make you dry and you might not have an operation. And if you can do those kind of things and avoid surgery, that's the best thing you can do, okay? If you don't need to have an operation for incontinence, you're way